Good morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. It's 9 a.m. I'm very backlit, so no one can see me. I just look like a shadow. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's better. Um, are people signing in? Yes, we are All right, still playing. I'm just and sharing. I, hi, Rosie. Hey. Rosie, it's been so long since I've seen you or spoken to you. I know, right? It's been like an hour. <laughs> Are your partners coming on? Uh, Katie's coming on a little later because okay. it's like an appointment. And then Juliana is, I'm not sure about Juliana. Uh, Juliana okay. isn't joining. I think she has uh, something to do today. Uh, well, mandatory. Yeah, she has her, um, her orientation for her new role that she's assumed here at Lenox Hill. So. Uh, interesting. Okay. Well, Rosie, you've got... Um, basically a full hour then and so for the people viewing i'm just going to take a brief second to introduce we have a great day today um this is one of my favorite lectures because i think it's really relevant it's talking about you know rosie is a, a clinical research fellow of ours she spent a year with us um i think talking about kind of how you get interested in research and how you go about trying to do research and then what you learn or how do you how do you really use a mentor to teach you how to do this the right way um, and how to stay sane during the process, especially maybe when you're working with someone who might not be totally sane. Um, so I think there's a lot of utility in hearing this from someone close to where you guys are in life, um, potentially. Uh, Katie was also one of our research fellows. She'll give a slightly different kind of perspective on the whole thing. They both did a fantastic job. We're super lucky to have had them, and they both had really productive years, which is fantastic. Um, just briefly, because I probably won't be here for the second lecture, John Caridi is up next, and... Um, Christy and Samantha will give him a brief introduction. He's one of our spine surgeons here. He's a, a um, dedicated spine surgeon. That's his whole career. He's going to talk to you guys about um, kind of indications and cases and how we do things in spine surgery, which is a huge part of neurosurgery for those who don't know. It's about 70% of neurosurgery. So um, stay tuned for that without a doubt. And then at 11 is also one of my favorite lectures. Today's just like, it's just my favorite day. It's a, it's a great day. Um, where you're going to hear about that global pathway. And based on the conversation yesterday, where we've got everyone from, you know, New Jersey to uh, Kenya here on this call, um, which are, I guess that's the beginning and the end of the world. I don't know. I don't know how that works. But either way, everyone's here and um, everyone wants to, you know, do something in medicine. You're going to learn valuable tips and tricks on, on kind of how to outline your life, um, how to how to choose that journey. And uh and so it's going to be such an exciting day, and I'm really happy everyone's here. I'll be checking in periodically. The floor, Rosie, is yours, um, and KDSC just signed on. So have a great day, everyone, and welcome to day two. Thank you. Chris, okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, I can do a brief intro for both of y'all um, before you get started. Uh, so uh, both Katie and Rosie were selected as Lenox Hills Neurosurgery's Jenna Chiavelli Clinical Research Fellows and participated in a one-year research fellowship program at Lenox Hill from July 2023 to June 2024. Rosie received a Bachelor of Science in Biology from St. John's University in Queens in 2024 and will be starting medical school at SUNY Downstate in the fall of 2024. Um, Katie received her Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience from the University of so Southern California in 2023 and will be starting medical school out at Mount Sinai um, in the fall of 2024. Um, so the floor is yours, Rosie and Katie. Katie, I'll go ahead and start since I have it all ready. And Christy, you can see my slides, right? Yes, looks great. Okay. So hi, everyone. Oops, let me play from the beginning. I'm Rosie, and as Christy mentioned, I was a Jenna's Kids Clinical Research Fellow this past year at Lenox Hill, and um, my mentor for the year was um, Dr. D'Amico. So I'll just be explaining a little bit about my own experience and um, essentially what that looked like this past year, and also talking about ways you can get involved in research, not only as an undergrad, but as a med student and beyond medical school. 
So a little bit about me and my research experience. I did undergraduate bench lab research in uh, diabetes and glioblastoma lab studying metabolic cell alterations. And I did this for around two years. I then decided I wanted to do something that was a bit more applicable to, I guess, the real world setting and applicable to the fields I was one day hoping to go into, which was um, medicine and neuroscience. And this is what led me to apply to um, an opportunity in clinical research, specifically through the Feinstein Institute's internship at Lenox Hill. And I did this, I think, as a third year college student. So um, it was a really great experience. And I think this is what really set the stage for me to want to learn to to want to continue working on in this area of neuroscience and specifically at Lenox Hill. So when this um, job, this fellowship had an opening, I decided to apply and I decided to spend my gap year here at Lenox Hill working with um, all of these incredible neurosurgeons, working with Dr. D'Amico. And I think um, it has been such a great experience and I know that um, it has prepared me well for starting med school this upcoming fall at SUNY Downstate. So now I'll talk a little bit about what being a clinical research fellow actually is and what it entails. So a large part of the experience involves shadowing in not just the operating room, but in clinic. And this was really important in not just providing us with this firsthand understanding of what neurosurgery, what neurosurgery actually is and what types of cases are treated, but it additionally, it sort of helped us understand which specialties, which neurosurgical specialties in particular, we were interested in doing research in. And so by shadowing Dr. D'Amico, Dr. Bookfar, Dr. Langer, and Dr. Ellis in the OR, I really think that we gained valuable insights and sort of a clear direction for our research interests. So I will briefly talk about some of the research that we're doing at Lenox Hill and sort of what I focused on throughout this year. So I think early on, I always really had an interest in neuro-oncology and I sort of wanted to focus um, more on that. So I, sorry. So I decided to work on a lot of case reports and I guess projects that were focused on neuro-onc and specifically connectomics. And I think for those of you who don't know, you'll be hearing from Dr. D'Amico within the next two weeks on what connectomics actually is, but connectomics is the structural and functional study of relationships in the brain and connections. And um, it sort of involves mapping and understanding these intricate connections and sort of how they function and how they contribute to brain function. And this is important because we are able to study how it's implicated in a patient's, um, in each and every patient. And this involves studying key functional networks, such as language, memory, um, motor skills, and um, it sort of helps us in understanding how preserving these networks is important to um, maximizing any minimizing any potential injury to them during surgery. And um, it essentially helps guide preoperative approach, intraoperative navigation, intraoperative na navigation and things like that. So now I will talk about about talk about getting involved in clinical research or just research in general as an undergrad student and how you can sort of find opportunities that that are helpful and can sort of help you get your foot in the door. So this is sort of based on my own experience as well and so several of the different opportunities I applied to when I was 
an undergrad and when I was sort of looking for ways to get involved, even though I had no experience whatsoever. And so one of the main ways I sort of reached out to people was by contact contacting my professors on campus. So I was able to reach out to professors who I was very interested in the research and I knew I had my own personal interest in neuroscience and I sort of sent a whole bunch of emails to professors whose research was so sort of focused on neuroscience. So um, that is a great way to um, get in contact with people. And sometimes you can even work with the professors who you've had undergraduate classes with. Another important way to get involved is through undergraduate research programs. And I know I mentioned I did Feinstein. So Feinstein was just one example of a summer internship, summer in research program that can be done as a student in college. And it's a great way to really get involved early on and really have this experience either in a bench lab research setting or in a clinical research setting in a hospital. And so often these opportunities are paid and they are um, also important for building your resume and, and um, sort of setting the stage for doing research as a med student later on. Um, another aspect that is important is academic, um, doing academic classes that have research components. So this means that sometimes you'll sign up for an undergraduate course and you will receive research credit for it. And it can be pretty much in anything in biology and organic chemistry and gen chem. And it's a great way to um, to not, it's, it's a great way to both earn credit and both have, um, both learn the um, essentials of research early on. So I am not a med student yet, but I will be in the coming months. So I did do some asking around for these next slides and how getting involved in research as a med student and beyond is um, then the different ways that exist. So getting involved in research as a med student, it's very similar to what I described earlier, and you'll see that a lot of these, these things overlap. So re joining a research lab or group, and this often involves, again, contacting professors, clinical researchers, physicians whose work interests you and who are willing to mentor you and sort of guide you in your process. There's also departmental research groups and many med students have, many med schools, sorry, have these, depart, these departmental research groups that can join. And also I think something that's sort of becoming more common is looking, looking online for research groups. And I know that I've seen a few through Instagram and I've seen a few on Google that sometimes pop up. So I think that just being proactive and just um, trying to look for these on your own is very important, very necessary. Medical school also have research programs and some of these are summer research, clinical research oriented and they're not necessary, they don't always have to be offered by your home institution. So if there are different um, programs, um, it's definitely worth looking into them and applying to them. Um, student research organizations, I know that I know a couple of students who are members of AANS, CNS chapters at their school. So joining these student research organiz organizations and participating in their activities and their networking events is is um, a great way to start doing research or at least meet people who you want to do research with. And I included something specifically for international students. So I know sometimes as an international student, it's tough to find research and find ways to um, get get yourself involved. So for 
international students, something that I've heard that could be very helpful is doing these research focused or in rotations and you essentially choose these clinical rotations and departments and electives and departments that have strong research programs. And if neurosurgery is something you're interested in, then um, it can provide exposure to, to ongoing research and opportunities to get involved. Getting involved in research beyond medical school. So again, this is kind of similar, but um, a big um, piece of advice that I heard from some of the physicians and some of the fellows that I worked with this past year was getting involved already as a physician or when past the medical school stage sort of involves seeking out a good mentor who is active in research and who can provide guidance and support and also sort of um, on your own attending workshops that are focused on research methods, skills, and grant writing. Um, online research opportunities, so also participating in online research projects or groups, as I mentioned earlier, that can be found sometimes through Instagram, Google. So they're also very flexible and they can they provide access to research experiences outside your institution. And again, networking is super important, important and it allows you to connect with people who may have available research opportunities for you. And so going to conferences, participating in these online research forums, and just keeping an eye out on social media sometimes is necessary and a great way to to um, understand the opportunities that are available to you. And this is my contact info for any additional questions. I am pretty responsive through email. So if there's anything that I don't get to answer, feel free to shoot me an email and I will get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Um... Uh, if everybody could also, if you have questions, make sure that you're um, doing that in the Q&A. Um, and I'm going to give the floor to Katie to also present. Um, if Katie, you're there. Yes, thank you, Rosie, for your amazing PowerPoint. Hey, guys. Um... I'll go ahead and share my presentation. It's not too long. Um, and then at the end, I believe we'll have some time for questions. Um, and hopefully we can get, I saw a few people went ahead and put those in the Q&A. So we'll make sure to get everything answered. Um, but just a little bit about me. My name is Katie Stark. Um, I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, as Christy so kindly introduced me. Um, I went to USC for undergrad, um, graduated about now uh, 13, 14 months ago. Um, and I studied neuroscience in undergrad. Um, and then this past year was uh, one of the fellows in the Jenna Chiavelli Fellowship. Um, and then I'm starting medical school actually in like, two or three weeks at uh, the Con School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. So I'm super excited. Um, and Rosie gave you guys a really great overview when, when it comes to getting involved in research and um, undergrad and um, medical school and beyond. But I'm going to just talk a little bit more about my experience um, throughout the fellowship so you guys can get an idea of what I did and maybe the types of research that are good to get involved in during your gap year. Um, so there are a lot of elements to do with this fellowship. Clinical research really is the main focus, um, in terms of getting experience in clinical research, um, and gaining those skills that we can apply them in medical school. But, um, there's so much more to this position. Um, one of the parts of the job is we coordinate student shadowing. I'm not sure if any of you have shadowed at Lenox Hill, but, um, we're the responsible for creating schedules, getting students um, situated. So whether that's medical students, um, 
undergrad students, we get to hang out with them and make sure that everybody's set up. Um, another big part of the job is clinic, um, helping out in the clinic, shadowing in clinic, um, and really spending time with patients, which has been super beneficial, I believe, um, before I go to medical school. Um, and then we also get to spend time in the operating room, as Rosie mentioned, um, figuring out what our interests are, um, filming in the OR, and uh, collecting for those attendings. Um, and then kind of one of the biggest takeaways, and um, I'll talk about this more later, is just like the mentorship that we gain. We're all assigned to a different attending. Um, and mine was Dr. Langer this year, so I just feel super grateful. And um, I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, so Rosie really talked about a little bit of the research she did this year. I thought I would just mention a few of the studies that are either have already been published that I worked on this year or are in the process of being published so you guys can get a sense of kind of the breadth that we cover. Um, so this, this first one was leveraging digital health to improve patient outcomes um, and communication. And so Dr. Langer um, uses Playback Health. It's a tech startup um, aimed to improve patient communication um, as well as really improve the workflow for physicians um, in clinic and beyond. Um, so I did a report on this and this was just really cool because it gave me a different insight into healthcare and allowed me a little bit to learn about um, the startup side of healthcare and instead of really being involved in super um, nitty gritty bench research or even looking at disease or treatment or outcomes, um, I got to look at health tech, healthcare, healthcare tech. Um, and so this was like kind of my how I started. And then um, one of the case reports I worked on was called Stage Cerebral and Brachiocephalic Bypass in a patient with MCA and Brachiocephalic Stent Occlusion. Um, this gave me the opportunity to work with some of the surgical fellows as well as a few medical students. Um, so that's just an example of a case report. Um, another one was protecting the temporal branch of the facial nerve. Um, this was about using a new monitoring technique during craniofacial surgery. Um, and this was a case series. And what was fun about this study is that I went into the OR for this case, um, did a ton of filming, and I actually put together a, a video or a movie, and the movie will be published with the paper as well. So um, kind of a different side of research. And then another meta-analysis would be called a virtual stimulation for device selection and sizing and endovascular treatment of intracranial aneurysms. So, this gave me exposure to meta-analysis and literature review. And so I did a ton of academic reading and writing for this paper. Um, and then finally, this last one at the bottom was actually my very own case study. Um, so I was really involved in every step of the way of this paper. So um, I hope that gives you a little bit of an insight of the different types of clinical research that I was involved in, but um, there are about six or seven other projects that are still outstanding. So. Um, it's just been wonderful to gain insight into different types of clinical research because it can be pretty varied. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, some of the studies that I did were case studies, um, case series, meta-analyses, literature reviews, retrospective reviews, and um, Rosie and Juliana were also involved in some prospective research studies as well, um, but really gained experience in academic reading and writing. Um, that's a huge part of research and um, probably something you started getting involved in in undergrad, um, but just really familiar, familiarizing yourself with um, how these things are, how to write and read and gaining literacy is super important. So um, that's always something you can be practicing and reading up on areas that you're interested in. Um, also just learning how to really read an electronic medical record and collecting data as well as um, entering data and analyzing it was also part of the job. Um, I mentioned spending time in the operating room and filming, creating videos um, for technical case instructions, um, as well as 
working with um, researchers all in all in different parts of their journey. So I worked with undergraduate students, medical students, um, surgical fellows, residents, attendings, um, and just really gaining insight from each and every one of them. Um, so as I have been discussing, research is obviously a huge part of the position. Um, and I hope you guys gained some insight from my talk as well as Rosie's. But honestly, I think the biggest takeaway oops, um, from this position was the mentorship that I gained. Um, so I was with Dr. Langer, as I mentioned, and I'll just give you a few of the takeaways that I learned from him this year. So um, basically, I spent all my time in the operating room with him or the clinic. And he has these sayings that he always says to patients. And um, since you guys are doing this virtually, you won't get to be in clinic with Dr. Langer. I'm going to give you a few of like his common quotes that he tells patients um, because these really help educate the patient and um, also comfort the patient. And they've taught me a lot about medicine and I hope that you can gain a little bit of insight from that as well. Um, first one is there are four kinds of surgeries. Surgery you shouldn't have, surgery you can have, surgery you should have, and surgery you must have. Um, so this is something that Dr. Langer talks to his patients about. He really sees quite a variety of neurosurgical cases. He does spine, he does some tumor, he also does um, neurovascular. So there's all different types of um, urgencies when it comes to getting an operation. So he really says this almost every appointment. Um, so patients understand how urgent their surgery is if they're making the, the, the decision to be operated on just for a lifestyle choice or if it really is a life-saving surgery. Um, and I know that I will definitely think about this as I progress through medical school and learn about different types of treatment, whether it's neurosurgery or not. So another common one he talks about with aneurysm patients is um, the best state of treatment aneurysm is the day before it bleeds. Um, but the thing about aneurysms is that although the size or location um, may provide some insight into risk of bleeding, there's really no way to know if an aneurysm will or won't, will not bleed. Um, so it really is a good uh, this phrase really helps represent men, men, one of the many unknowns in medicine, um, as well as neurosurgery. One of the things I learned through this position is that neurosurgery is very, very, um, there's, it's not black and white. So many unknowns and often in the field of medicine, we're given um, limited information and we have to stick to our decisions. So um, once again, whether it's neurosurgery or not, I, this phrase will always remind me that Sometimes we don't have all the information and we have to do best with it what we can. So um, next is once you decide to do an operation, there's no benefit in waiting. Um, this one's pretty straightforward, but it really helps comfort patients and empowers them to be brave. I mean, getting brain surgery is of course no small feat um, and very scary, but it reminds patients that once you decide to do it, you gotta stick to your guns. And then one of my favorites and the last one I'll leave you with today is you'll die of something else. Um, Dr. Langer says this in like a really dry and sarcastic tone. Um, and it really is meant to aim to help patients and comfort them. Um, so after a patient is treated successfully, this is really a phrase of victory. And it means, you know, um, you're gonna die of something else. and this, it just also reminds us is the, the importance of humor and medicine and um, how that's kind of a lost art. Um, so I hope that you guys got a little bit of an insight into my year, um, but I'm also happy to talk about the research that I did in undergrad. Um, medical school journey, like applying to medical school, happy to answer that as well. Um, but we'll go ahead and look in that. Q&A led by Christy. So um, super nice to meet you all and hopefully you learned something. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie and Rosie. Um, 
if y'all want to go ahead and put in your questions in the Q&A and while we're waiting for that to kind of fill in, um, I was hoping, uh, Katie, if you could kind of talk about the background of the fellowship and like how it got started, um, just to give some people who may not know what the fellowship is, just a little bit more background. Yeah, of course. Um, so as you guys noticed, it's called the Jenna Chia Belly Fellowship. Um, and Jenna was a patient of Dr. Bookbar um, and was being cared for by the team at Lennox Hill Neurosurgery. Um, a few years back, and she was actually, unfortunately, diagnosed with glioblastoma um, and worked with the clinical trials team and actually was the first human to do a new trial and um, really demonstrated a lot of bravery um, throughout the course of her treatment, always had a smile on her face no matter what. And she just like was a huge inspiration to everybody at the practice. Um, unfortunately, she passed, but um, her family really wanted to um, memorialize her in a positive way because she was actually going into healthcare um, and she was about the age of somebody who would be in their gap year before medical school so um, they wanted to fund education um, and really memorialize her in a way that she would be proud of so um, that's some background on the fellowship yeah um, so I can see all these questions coming in. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, for the first question, if you guys want to talk about, I see a lot of questions about like the applications, like when they come out, how you approach them. Um, so I guess if you guys want to talk about um, how you approach the application and also when those applications usually come out. Um, Rosie, I don't know if you want to start. Applications for the fellowship or for med school? Or the fellowship. Okay. So usually yearly, the application for the fellowship opens around the end of December, or early January, I think. And so in terms of preparing for it, um, I might just talk, talk a little bit about what I think strengthened my application and what I thought was helpful in, in sort of getting me to the interview stage for this, for this position. And I do think I had a strong interest in neuroscience research coming from an undergraduate lab and sort of continuing to do research as a summer intern where I happened to be assigned to Lenox Hill. So having these experiences and making the connections I did at Lenox Hill while I was there, even though I was only there for a month or two, I think really sort of solidified my own interest in wanting to pursue this during my gap year. And I think that's something that really came through in my interviews is my genuine interest and my genuine um, desire to want to go into medicine and specifically um, do research in neuroscience. Yeah, Katie, do you have an, if you want to talk about it too? Um, I think Rosie touched on the biggest things, but yeah, I think, um, also coming into this and making a genuine connection. I mean, I think they really want somebody that also works well with patients um, and is a good addition to the team. Um, you work with really everybody in the practice. So um, it's being yourself, being authentic, I think is also just important when you're in the um, interview process, uh, but it is very selective. We helped review the applications this past year um, and there were, a lot of applicants, but um, it's definitely something you all should look into because it was a wonderful experience. I see a couple of questions on where to apply for the fellowship. So usually the link is posted sometime at the end of December um, on their Instagram, on Lennox Hill Neurosurgery's Instagram, and um, also on their LinkedIn, Facebook. I think it's posted pretty much everywhere. So when the time comes, I think you will be able to find it. If not, um, also sending an email to the Lennox Hill Neurosurgery email, which is also linked in the bio and in, on Instagram is also a great way of getting access to the application. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the questions I see a lot about are the schedule, like what was your schedule like um, from day to day and like the hours of the fellowship? Yeah, I can chat on uh, 
speak on this briefly. So it depends a little bit about who your mentor is and their, their schedule looks like. Um, but essentially it's a nine to five, um, Monday through Friday. And um, that really gives you the opportunity to be there for um, surgeries, um, clinic, et cetera. Um, sometimes we'll come in earlier, um, as you guys can imagine, uh, surgeries often start early in the morning. Um, but this schedule is relatively flexible because um, they understand that it's our gap year. Um, but yeah, it's definitely at least a five-day commitment um, and a full-time commitment as well. Yeah. Um, Rosie, is there anything you wanted to add or? Um, I think like Katie said, it definitely varied for each position and depending on who we were paired with, our schedule looked very different each day. and sort of my day to day was every morning I would sort of round a doctor to me, go see patients he had operated on during the week or the week before. And if it was a clinic day, I would spend time with him in clinic. If it was an OR day and he had one or two cases then I would do that. And then I would try to work on some research in between. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Uh a question I'm seeing a lot too is about um, the cost of living and like stipend stuff. If y'all want to talk about that, a lot of them are wondering if you were able to afford living in the city with the fellowship. So we do get a stipend, a stipend. It's not much though. So it might not be able to cover um, living expenses in New York if you're not already in New York. So since I'm already from New York, it was just a better option for me to commute to and from work. So Katie, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, um, as Rosie mentioned, there is this monthly stipend, um, but living in New York City is very expensive. Um, so um, that's definitely something to consider when you're applying. Um, I know it, often it's very difficult to find paid research positions. Um, so it's great to have some support, um, but definitely important to keep in mind when you're applying. Yeah, for sure. Um, another question that I think is a pretty good question is if there's any specific readings you guys had to do during your experience, um, as they would assume that it would be hard to follow the surgeries without any medical training, are there any resources you would recommend? I think that coming into this job, I did a bit of pre-reading on different topics. And I think I mentioned in my presentation that I was interested in neuro-onc and I focused my pre-reading on this, but I wasn't very limited on what I wanted to read. And I came in very open-minded on, on what I wanted to explore in terms of neurosurgical specialties. So I would say I didn't do as much pre-reading maybe as I should have, but um, I think that once you're present and once you're at Lenox, you sort of have a good idea of what you're what you're interested in and that sort of kind of ignites a desire to want to keep reading about it so I think being at Lenox and being there every day was sort of how I got more into reading and more so realizing what I was actually interested in yeah I I think they don't expect you to come in um, with a complete medical background I mean they know that we're just coming from college um, like I mentioned, I studied neuroscience in college, so I think that was definitely very helpful um, to have kind of a vernacular um, in neuroscience, um, but they really know that you're there, there to learn and they're amazing teachers, so you really learn as you go. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a lot of questions. If we could backtrack a little bit to logistics, I see a lot of questions about um, like who's eligible, like who you would recommend to uh, do the fellowship or apply for the fellowship. Um, I see questions about like if a pre-PA student should do uh, should apply or like if it's open to international, um, which I think has to do more of cost of living um, if you can afford it or not. But um, and just like how long the fellowship is, if y'all want to talk about that. So in terms of eligibility. It's right now it's just pre-medical students who are who just completed undergrad. So if you just completed your undergrad experience anywhere in the United States, then you are eligible to apply. I don't think it's open for international students. And 
I do think there is an emphasis on having someone with a pre-med background. So not really pre pre nursing or pre PA. Yeah. Um, to the international student thing, I think that you could apply if you're an international student. Um, Lenox would not sponsor your visa. Um, so that's definitely something to consider. Um, but it is really a pretty open application process, um, but it really is like preparing you to go to medical school in terms of getting that research experience. Um, but if you're a pre-PA or pre-nursing, um, that doesn't bar you from applying, um, but it is really in a program for um, people who wanna be doctors. But I, I mean, I think there's a lot to benefit from um, whether you're going to medical school or not. So I wouldn't let that stop you. Um, I'll let Christy let you choose the next question. Um, yeah, I see, just to reiterate, I do see somebody asking what the website is for applying. Um, the applications come out you, like December, January-ish, right? Um, and usually they would post about it um, and it's on like the Instagram bio if y'all want to look at that um, once the new, it's for time for the new application cycle. Um, but... I see a question about what was the most important uh, thing you guys got out in your year as a fellow in this fellowship? Who wants to start? <laughs> um, I will. I think that I, I talked about this a little bit, but it's just the mentorship that I gained. I think that whether you pursue this fellowship or something else, different in your gap year or if you're still early in um, your undergrad experience, it's just really important to find um, mentors, whether it's research or not. Um, I've gained so much from my relationship with Dr. Langer as well as the other attendings. Um, but beyond that, just like the PAs that I work for, the administrators, um, I think the relationships that you take away are the most important. Obviously, there's like a lot of um, pressure sometimes to get research done before you go to medical school, and that certainly is important. But um, I think sometimes taking a step back and really cherishing the relationships that you make is one of the most important things that you can do, um, at least that I have found to be helpful. So um, whether it's getting advice from those mentors, um, they help me throughout my application process in terms of giving advice. Um, so I think that would probably be my biggest, my biggest um, thing I gained. And for me, I think I would agree with Katie as I think the greatest takeaway for me was just building a good relationship with my mentor, Dr. D'Amico, and having him sort of um, guide me in my research writing process and sort of in my med school journey. And I think that that kind of support and that kind of one-on-one um, -on -one mentorship experience that we get is really, really invaluable and really important to us as we continue on to medical school. So I think that, um, yeah, it's been mentorship is my greatest takeaway. Yeah, um, for sure. A lot of there's questions about uh, how the publications work. Um, I guess if y'all want to talk about like what that process was like for you. Sure, I can go ahead. So um, with any paper that you write, it's sort of starts off as this research idea or a hy hypothesis formulation, if you will. And it'll sort of start out sometimes with the literature review, if you can find anything on your research idea and whether there's existing papers on it where um, um, there's, and what's like the current state of knowledge on it. And it sort of helps you identify any gaps that your own research question can address. So I think that when you're actually, um, this sort of sets the, the stage for actually conducting your own research and sort of working on data collection and data analysis or just um, writing the manuscript. So it's, the publication process is, takes a while and it goes from selecting a journal, submitting your manuscript, and then there's a peer review process and also sometimes getting revisions back. So the publication process definitely takes a while and it sometimes depends on the type of research that you're submitting and the type of things that you're writing about. So yeah, Katie, I'm not sure if you wanna 
add to that? No, I think I think Rosie covered that well. It just really depends on what type of research you're doing. I mentioned kind of the different types of studies, whether it's like a meta-analysis, a case report, a uh, retrospective study, case series. Um, but they really guide you through the process. I, as we both mentioned, we both had clinical research experience in undergrad, so definitely having um, some experience made the, it a little bit easier, but I definitely learned a lot of new skills when it came to getting publications written and published. Yeah, speaking of clinical uh, opportunities, there's a lot of questions about like how you guys got those clinical hours and those opportunities. Um, and if y'all wanna kind of like talk about like what they were um, too, in addition to that. Yeah, so for me, I, to get my clinical hours, I started off volunteering at a hospital and though I really enjoyed volunteering it wasn't as hands-on as I would have liked and it was just very minimal tasks and very minimal patient experience that I would actually get and so I decided to become an EMT I think in my first or second year of college so I was an EMT for most of for about three or four years I think before even applying to this fellowship and I think that it was the bulk of, that's how I got the bulk of my clinical hours that I needed for medical school and for applying. And it's also really great for getting hands-on patient experience. So definitely becoming an EMT is something I recommend if you are interested in getting clinical hours. Yeah. Um, Rosie and I also went to undergrad during COVID. So um I got started a little bit later, but I also volunteered at a hospital. Um, I did research at a children's hospital in Los Angeles, which is where I went to undergrad, um, which gave me some clinical shadowing um, experience as well. And then I think also working, um, doing service is really important. Um, I worked for a nonprofit to do with drug overdose. Um, so volunteering around Los Angeles in that area also gave me some a different type of clinical exposure kind of outside of a hospital setting. Um, and I think it's just really about identifying what you're interested in um, and whether that's service learning, um, typical volunteering in a hospital or research, um, getting that exposure is really helpful in undergrad. Sure. Um... There's a question about how did you guys know that you wanted to go into neuroscience? For me, I think I was always really fascinated by the brain from a young age. And I don't really remember when or when exactly this started, but I think that it's just something that in college I was consistently interested in. And I knew that I wanted to somehow continue pursuing this in my research. So yeah, I don't know when it started, but I think it was just a um, an interest from childhood, so. Yeah, my I feel like I definitely have always been interested since I was a kid, but kind of my um, seedling came from the fact that my grandmother who lived with me throughout high school was diagnosed with Alzheimer's um, and she was living with us like as she went through the um, diagnosis process and also like as her disease really progressed and it was like a pretty emotional time for my family and I just really wanted to understand it and so I kind of started digging into um, the topic as a high school student and found out that I was really interested in it. Um, applied as a neuroscience major when I applied to college. Um, I just loved the study. Um, down to the molecular level. I really enjoy neuroscience. Um, if nobody has a major pick yet, if there are any high school students, I really loved my neuroscience undergrad degree. Um, but then I did actually my research in undergrad in pediatric pulmonology, but they put me on a project um, that has to do with fetoscopic neurosurgery. Um, so on teeny tiny babies. Um, and so that allowed me to work with a team of neurosurgeons um, and that allowed me to see that I actually think my interest in neuroscience maybe would extend to a procedural um, profession in neurosurgery. So that's why I, I pursued this. And I also just um, did some plenty of shadowing throughout undergrad and 
honestly still in high school with some um, surgeons in various specialties. So I knew I was always been interested in surgery, um, but that's kind of my story. And I think I'll continue pursuing it in medical school. Yeah. Uh, there's another question about, uh, is there like a, a favorite paper that y'all like worked on or published um, during your time uh, working with your doctors? I think for me, my favorite project or paper that I published was probably the first paper I published on connectomics in January of this year. And what makes this paper so, I think, import important to me was the fact that I actually knew the patient I was writing about and I had seen her in the clinic and I had seen her surgery and I had sort of followed up with her postoperatively. And just having all of that come full circle and being able to write and publish on her unique case was something that I really enjoyed and something that I was really happy to work on. Um, one of my favorite research projects, I actually did it included in my um, presentation, but I, as I mentioned, Dr. Langer um, has a neurovascular focus. And so I did a large data collection on aneurysm treatment. Um, so looking at the differences in aneurysm characteristics between patients who were treated endovascularly, so uh, with a catheter um, versus with an open surgery. And um, it was collection on about a 500 patients. So it was a really lengthy process. I honestly was working on it all year. Um, but it really taught me so much about um, aneurysm treatment. And I would see many of those patients in clinic throughout the year. I watched the surgery. So I really got to apply the knowledge that I learned um, to the real world. Um, and I feel like it's an area that I feel very comfortable in. And so kind of having a long-term research project gave me the expertise um, in an area. And that was a, a really meaningful experience. Yeah, sounds really cool. <laughs> um, Going back to kind of like, I guess, schedule um, and logistics wise, there's questions about if you were able to work on uh, your medical school applications during the fellowship, um, if it would be possible to have a part time while doing uh, the fellowship. Um, but, so if y'all want to answer that. Um, yeah, Katie, you can go ahead. Sure. So I was only going to take one cap year. So that meant that I turned in my primary application May before the fellowship started. Um, but secondaries really, if you're on the early side of the application process, you're turning those in um, in July and August. So um, yes, there was definitely time to be doing your applications um, in terms of getting those secondaries written. Um, if you're taking more than one gap year, um, our co-fellow, Juliana, um, she studied for the MCAT during the year, um, but that was just like a little bit more difficult um, because the MCAT is a big commitment. Um, so Rosie and I had done our MCAT prior to the fellowship, which I would recommend just so that you have it out of the way and you're able to really focus on the fellowship. But um, there, if you haven't taken it, that doesn't bar you at all from applying. Um, you can still get a lot of out of the experience. Um, so it just really depends on where you are in your journey. Yeah, I saw there was a question about like if they could apply even if they were going into like a second gap year. That's what Juliana did, right? Like that was her second gap year. Yeah, yeah so yeah, can, it's totally yeah. fine. Yeah, um, a question going back towards like applications. Um, I think y'all touched a little bit on it, but I don't know if y'all want to give tips um, about just applications. They're asking about like um, what you feel like made you stand out to get an interview um, and get the fellowship. Um, I think I touched on this a little bit before on sort of what I thought made me a strong applicant and what I thought what were um, assets to my application, but I think it was not just my, I'll add to it now, it wasn't just my clinical research background, but also a lot of patient interaction and a lot of patient experience that I had 
working as an EMT, uh, as a hospital volunteer, and also just other experiences that were non-clinical that I felt were very influential in my in my undergraduate career and were sort of um, things that I could talk about and things that I was genuinely interested in. And some of the things that I was really passionate about was tutoring for nonprofit organizations and also just volunteering at different um, shelters throughout New York City. So these are all non-clinical activities that sometimes people don't think that are important to any application, but they do make a huge difference, not just in applying for a fellowship like this, but also applying for medical school. Yeah, um, I think Rosie hit the big things. I would say just it's important. Um, I would say some clinical research experience, um, maybe outside of a wet lab doing some academic reading and writing, as I mentioned, um, clinical research is good to have something under your belt. Um, I think also an interest, some sort of interest in the neurosciences. You don't necessarily have to have neurosurgery research, um, but I definitely think the fellowship is best suited for somebody that's interested in neurosurgery. Um, it's okay if you're not committed to it. I don't know if I'm going to be a neurosurgeon yet, um, but I think that you will definitely get the most out of it if you're interested in neurosurgery, um, maybe more specifically than just neuroscience um, or say like neurology, um, cause it really is quite a different practice, um, setting and different patient population. Yeah. Um, to finish us off, we're going to do one last question. Um, if y'all could talk about, since y'all are going to medical school, which is so exciting, uh, this fall, if y'all could talk about why y'all chose, uh, your medical schools and what, like, I guess your, um, the process was for that of like choosing like which ones you wanted to apply to um, and why ultimately you chose that medical school. Um, I don't know who wants to start, but. I can start. I think that for me, choosing a medical school was sort of rooted in my decision to want to stay in New York and sort of worked with sort of this diverse patient population that I was already so familiar with working as an EMT throughout Queens, throughout Brooklyn, and throughout the surrounding areas of New York City. So I thought to myself earlier, early on in my, when I was in college, I said to myself, if I can any way stay in New York and continue working in areas like this, and that would be ideal. So that's sort of what led me to choose to go to school in Brooklyn. And I really never looked back and thought I should be anywhere else. <laughs> Um, I would say, I think my first guiding factor in up choosing medical schools is that I knew I wanted to be, um, probably in a city for reasons similar to Rosie's, um, just getting exposure to diverse patient populations, um, really seeing impactful and interesting cases where there would be like a high density of, um, interesting cases and in patients, um, so I, I really mostly applied to schools and cities. I also really wanted to go to a school um, that was like a research institution and had lots of support for um, research. And um, so big research institutions, you can really figure those out. Um, you can do a lot of research on medical schools with the MSAR um, and what other factors. I really applied all over the country um, just to diversify my options. I think applying to a lot of medical schools um, is important. And um, I was choosing between a few different places, but ultimately landed on Sinai, um, which I'm very excited about. I love New York City after working here for the year um, and kind of having family not too far um, and making these connections. I really loved being here. And so I'm super happy to just be about 20 blocks up the street from Lenoxville Hospital next year. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. It is um, 10 o'clock. So thank you guys so much for joining us and for talking. Um, I know I learned a lot. Hopefully the brain turns, you guys learned a lot too. But if you guys could just say thank you to Rosie and Katie for joining us today. Um, but thank you guys so much. Thank you for having us. And Feel free to email me any questions. I'll drop my email again in the chat for everyone. Yeah, I forgot to include my email, so I'll go ahead and put mine as well.
Um, I'm gonna have to hop off, but any more questions that we didn't get to, I will do my best to answer them um, amidst about Star Medical School and all that good stuff. Hope mm -hmm. you guys have a wonderful summer and relax too, that's important. Um, don't kill yourself over applying. It's important to be a person too. Yes, for sure. Thank, Thank you, you guys so much. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Rosie.